Welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast, helping people take their leadership to the next level. Brought to you by Blackby Ministries International. Well, welcome to the Richard Blackby Leadership Podcast. As always, we're joined by Richard Blackby. As always. As always. <laughs> Well, it's been a while since we've uh, looked at a leader and done a leadership profile. Mm -hmm. uh, last time, I think we had to take two episodes <laughs> because we just couldn't fit Winston Churchill you into one. You cannot fit Churchill into one of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Uh, so this time, we're, we're going to look at the life of John D. Rockefeller. Yeah. So why did you pick him? Well, uh, we looked at Churchill first, and he's, of course, a politician, government leader, uh, national leader. Uh, John Rockefeller is one of those unique individuals uh, in the world of business that uh, was a pioneer who achieved heights uh, no one had ever achieved before. Most people argue that he is America's first billionaire. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, you kind of have to kind of convert the dollar. He, he uh, lived into the 30s. And his his uh, wealth, if you converted it, certainly to today's standard, would have made him well over a billionaire. But like all uh, leaders that you read about, uh, he's a mixed bag. He's uh, in some ways uh, a, a bundle of contradictions, uh, a, a person who's trying to uh, deal with uh, demons from his past and uh, yet trying to juggle his own personal ambition with uh, what he hopes are noble sentiments that he has as well. The, the book, uh, the biography that I've, I've used is the one by Ron Chernow, who's a, it's a great historian. He's written a number of great biographies that uh, we'll probably look at some more that he's written over the time. But he wrote a book just called Titan, uh, The Life of John D. Rockefeller Sr. And I found it fascinating. Uh, it's, it's published in 1998. So I read it several years ago, but in terms of business biographies, it's one of those that I think if you really want to look at business leadership, uh, his is a his is a great one. A lot of things just to pull out about uh, Rockefeller. Of course, he he will become the the wealthiest person in the world, America's first billionaire. But uh, he, unsurprisingly, I suppose, grows up in a home of dire poverty. His father was a charlatan. His father, William Avery Rockefeller, kind of known as, went by Bill. Uh, Bill Rockefeller is one of those shysters who would go around selling special medicinal bottles of, of homebrew um, <laughs> medicines. And uh, in fact, he was he was known as Doc Rockefeller, uh, Doctor Bill. He would go around and tell people, "I've this can cure cancer," and uh, unless the cancer is, is quite advanced and even then it will be beneficial to you and he was uh he was just a shyster that uh, would head out on road trips and, and abandon his family for weeks and even months at a time ultimately he abandons his family entirely uh had he was a womanizer he's a flashy sort of uh charismatic guy with all kinds of stories of course he's walk into a complete uh, a, a town as a complete stranger and just draw a crowd and sell all kinds of product. And uh, his father loved money, loved to flash around lots of money. At one point he had a mistress and he actually had the audacity to take the mistress right into his house, make her his uh, housekeeper and was having children with both his wife and his mistress at the same time under the same wow. roof. Just... Uh, one of these people that ultimately the, the, the most shameful, the most painful part of Rockefeller's life was his father. Never wanted to talk about him, was embarrassed. Kept his father actually a, a, a deep, dark secret that uh, he tried to hide. He didn't want people to know about him. Uh, at a certain point, at, w at one point, as Rockefeller starts to have a job himself and earn some money, he, he remembers waking up one, in the middle of the night hearing his dad basically robbing his piggy bank, take, taking money from his own son, and uh, and then leaving again. And ultimately, 
uh, Bill Rockefeller married another woman. He's still married to his original wife, but he marries another woman, which is illegal, and starts an entirely different uh, family under a, a, a different identity. And in, interestingly, about the time he does that, he abandons his own family and basically tells his son, take care of your mother, take care of your siblings, and then leaves. Um, that as his father leaves in pursuit of money, pursuit of pleasure, his son begins his journey to become the wealthiest man in the country. Yeah, there's some, uh, definitely there's, there's some a, irony there. There is some irony in that. But uh, Rockefeller grew up extremely poor. Some of the things that really uh, affected him, one was they never had any money. Uh, they, they lived in threadbare clothing. And uh, so he, he valued money, obviously, and, and he found a security in money. And he was, in, in one sense, he was very cautious with money. He, even though he's very aggressive in building his business, he, um, he always had cash reserves. Uh, he, 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 he was always prepared for the worst possible crisis. He never knew how long his success could last because things always seemed to go s- south on him eventually when he, his dad was ruling his family. His mother was a devout, uh, very religious, and that also went deep into Rockefeller's uh, soul. He was a Baptist most all of his life, uh, taught a Sunday school class at his church, was uh, a tither. He was the, the world's wealthiest man, but he's very generous and uh, very meticulous about tithing his money to the church, even uh, as just a young man. And so you, you have these two kind of contrasting impulses. On the one hand, he's got this shyster of a father that he's ashamed of that values money, loves to throw money around. It comes quickly. It goes quickly. Uh, he goes from the heights down to the depths where he might lose everything. But then he also has this devout mother who loves God and trusts him. Uh, and so you've got these two strong impulses swirling about in Rockefeller's life. Interestingly, he and his brother William were so poor that when his school took a class picture of their class in school, they didn't let the Rockefeller boys be in the picture because their clothes were too shabby to be mm. included in the school picture, even though they're in the school. Wow. At one point, uh, Rockefeller fi- falls in love with uh, a young lady and wants to marry her, but uh, the, the, the young woman, her name was Melinda, and her parents won't let her marry Rockefeller because he just doesn't show any promise for, for the future, which I'm sure they were later regretting the fact <laughs> that they didn't let their daughter marry yeah. someone who was going to become the wealthiest man in American history. Uh, his biographer just says that Rockefeller was the embodiment of the Puritan work ethic. He just believed if you work hard, you can get ahead, and certainly he did. And it's interesting, when he first starts out, uh, he actually always celebrated September 26th, uh, 1855. He called that job day. That was a day he actually had to drop out of school just a few months before graduating because people, his biographer suspects that it's because his father had uh, married a second woman and he needed all the money he could get uh, to finance uh, his second marriage, his second family. And so Rockefeller drops out of school and has to get a job. Now it's basically his father abandons the family. So Rockefeller's got to provide for his mother as well as his siblings as the oldest child. And so he, uh, he calls his job day where he starts looking for a job. And, and he has an interesting approach to that. He, you know, a lot of people, when they're looking for work, they feel demoralized. They feel like, uh, boy, if I could just get a job. But he said, I have a job. He says, I was working every day at my business, the business of looking for work. And he mm. treated looking for work as his job. And so he would start out every morning uh, at the appropriate time, and he'd work all day trying to find a job. And as he gets his first job, he's meticulous. He's studious. He, he masters his responsibilities. He's the most reliable of all the staff and very quickly goes up the ladder Within three years, he'd already saved an entire year's worth of wages. He's, uh, he's very uh, stingy in, in one way is in terms of spending on himself. Now, he would tithe. He would give money to the church, but, um, but, he, but he didn't spend a lot on ex- extravagances. And, and really, until much, much later in his life, even the first number of homes that he owned, 
were very understated. Uh, he he kind of didn't like to flaunt his money. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, as he raised his kids, he had some kind of peculiar things he would do. For instance, he, even though when even when he's the wealthiest man in the country, he would make his kids share things. He might buy one bicycle, make his children share that one bicycle. Hmm. And he just said, I don't want them to uh, start thinking that, you know, they can just have whatever they want and they need to learn to share. And they, they wore hand-me-down clothes. In fact, his son, John Rockefeller Jr., he had a couple of older sisters. And for the, until he was about eight, John Rockefeller wore dresses because that's what got him handed down to him from his older sisters. And wow. so here's a guy, very, very wealthy. In fact, at one point when John Rockefeller Jr. was out in a rowboat, uh, a friend of his said to him, well, why don't you buy like a motorboat? And John Rockefeller said, what do you think we are, the Vanderbilts? <laughs> Which at that point, the Rockefellers had a lot more money than the Vanderbilts. Yeah. But, but his kids grew up not knowing that they were wealthy that their father was the most successful businessman in America. And so he had some kind of funny ways of raising his kids. He would lead his kids in uh, devotions, uh, prayer time each day. He actually levied a one penny fine if you were late for devotions. Uh, he had a very interesting way of, of uh, running his family. A couple of things are kind of interesting about uh, Rockefeller when you kind of look at why he became so successful when he started out in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And that's where he grew up. That's where he started his business, uh, in the oil fields in that area. And when, when he started out, there were many, many oil companies. His was not the most powerful, the, the best financed. He was one of many, kind of like, uh, Henry Ford, when he started out as car business, there were hundreds of car businesses. And, and so you wonder, well, why is it that certain people just rose magnificently above all the rest. And certainly Rockefeller was one. But he did a couple of things. One is, uh, his biographer says he was always daring in design, cautious in execution. So in other words, he was always very bold in his uh, vision of where they were going. He had always had great ambition. But when it came to implementing things, he was always careful. And, uh, and he also sought out the, the best people possible. When he saw talent, he, he attracted talent to him. And, uh, and uh, he said uh, that when he found, he, he always paid good money for good talent. He, he was never shy about giving a good wage if he thought he was going to get a return on that. And for years, he, would, uh, he did a couple of things that endeared people to him. Even though he was the, the biggest shareholder of Standard Oil, his, his company, he always made, he never owned a majority of the company. He, he owned maybe a third of the shares. And so that meant that he could never just dictate terms. He had to work with others. And he, he encouraged his chief lieutenants to all be shareholders because he felt like if they owned shares, they would want the company to do well. They'd never slack off because it would cost them personally. Yeah. And so he always encouraged people to, to buy shares, and uh, that way they had a personal stake, not just in collecting their paycheck, but in making the company profitable. And they would have a, an executive lunch every day up in the executive lunchroom of their, their building. And if you were one of the top directors, you were invited to attend that lunch. And interestingly, when you went to that lunch, Rockefeller's seat was not at the head of the table. He, he kind of, everybody sat in the very same seat. You had an assigned seat, but his was not the most prominent one. He tried to be collegial. In fact, he insisted that every major decision that they made would be unanimous, which is incredible considering the dog-eat-dog world that they were trying to fashion a company out of. Yeah. But what his, uh, what his biographer says is that it forced them to hash through and work through, argue through major decisions. And the biographer says they rarely made a mistake because by the time you had these aggressive, outspoken business people who all had a vested interest in making the right decision. Typically, they worked it out till they came out with the best decision possible. And so even though Rockefeller certainly was the most dominant person in the room, uh, he didn't just uh, dictate everything. He, he'd, he'd solicit people's opinion. He'd wanted to know, well, what do you think about this? What's your opinion about this? He got it all on the table. And certainly that was one of the secrets to his success. And interestingly, on a couple of occasions, 
uh, he would hire competitors. He'd hire opponents. At one point, another company uh, sued Standard Oil, and the attorney for the other company was was very sharp and did a great job and actually won the case. And uh, Rockefeller came to the opposing attorney after the case was settled, and he said, you have uh, given us a good licking today. He said, now I want to hire you and have you work for me. And so he would hire away. <laughs> if an attorney was good enough to beat him in court, he'd just hire that attorney. So now the, uh, that attorney fought for them in court instead of against them. He was that kind of person, and he'd pay them well enough that they would come. And several of the people he had hired for, uh, that he hired, like Henry Flagler uh, and uh, R- uh, R- Henry Rogers and some of those people, became significant, uh, very wealthy people themselves as they worked for John Rockefeller, but very creative. And, and of course, one of the things for Rockefeller that was so, uh, that was kind of a questionable thing in his past was, from his viewpoint, he saw all these different um, oil companies that were, were all struggling to survive. And at that time, the power brokers, the big companies, were the railroads. The railroads dominated business back in 1870s. And they could basically dictate terms. They, a railroad could, could destroy an oil company if they just raised the rates to ship uh, cans of barrels of oil, then it, it, they could destroy a company. And so Rockefeller saw how the, when you're divided, you've got 100 or more oil companies in the Cleveland area all competing, trying to undercut each other, trying to undersell one another, that there just would not be enough profit to make it worthwhile, and they'd all be vulnerable to the big uh, railroad companies. So so Rockefeller, in a massive uh, takeover, just basically bought out and forced out all of his rivals. And they, they call it the, the Cleveland Massacre, where within just a few months, he uh, took control of most of the other oil companies. And, and he, he was able to do that in various ways. He, he became a, a really good customer with the bank, and so banks would favor him over other rivals. He would work out under-the-table deals with railroad companies so that he got favorable rates and favorable treatment so that he ended up at the first of the line instead of other companies. Uh, he had a number of ways of just muscling out other other companies and rivals. At times, he'd just flat out buy them out. He'd, he'd just buy out their company and sometimes pay them a, a lucrative amount of money. At other times, he'd under-purchase them, just depending on the, the case. And and some of these guys he'd bring into his company. He might even have them continue running the, the refinery that he just bought. But before long, he was controlling 90% of all the oil industry production in America in this massive, complex uh, company. And whenever laws were passed to try to restrict him or keep him in line, he'd find a creative way to get around those laws. And, and so the interesting thing with Rockefeller is that in some ways he would do things that were, he was considered one of the robber barons. Yeah. In the, they call it the Gilded Age after the Civil War where people like J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller and the Vanderbilts and others were building their empires. And uh, Rockefeller had some pretty shady dealings that he had to deal with. And then later, under when, uh, for instance, uh, Ulysses Grant was the president, and in that era, um, there was a lot of graft. There was a lot of corruption. You, you paid off a lot of uh, congressmen to uh, look the other way and not pass regulatory laws that would hurt your business. And uh, Rockefeller typically turned a blind eye to that kind of thing. Uh, as long as business was done. He, he was one of these sort of paradoxes where, on the one hand, he saw himself as a very righteous, godly, church-going, Sunday school-teaching uh, businessman. But on the other hand, he also had a dark side where a lot of dark, underhanded business was done uh, to, to keep his company surviving when others were going under uh, by the dozens. And so uh, he's one of those guys that... Uh, was very shrewd at what he did. He always kept an eye on the business, but he he was great at delegating too. And uh, he wasn't he wasn't shy about um, about giving uh, his lieutenants lots of leeway in their decisions and getting their input. So he he always had some great people around him. He had a great comment about. Uh, I mean, he he was very punctual. He was never late for a meeting. 
He said a man has no right to occupy another man's time unnecessarily. He hated to have his time wasted. He he never came late. He never stayed late. I'm seeing why you uh, are uh, such a some, big fan of Rockefeller. He had some, uh, <laughs> yeah, he had some great uh, thought. One thing he said, uh, the power of concentration, you, you'll see this with a number of these leaders. Uh, they knew how to concentrate on the matter at hand. He said, do not many of us who fail to achieve big things fail because we lack concentration. The art of concentrating the mind on the thing to be done at the proper time and at the exclusion of all else. And so uh, he just said uh, the reason we were able to be so successful is um, uh, we, I, he knew how to focus until he solved the problem. And uh, he, he found the best solution. And he said others are just too distracted. He all, interestingly, he also was a, a creature of a routine and uh, kind of like Winston Churchill, he often took an afternoon nap and you'd think, this guy is building the biggest company in the world. He's, he's napping every afternoon after lunch? But, but he actually said that he tried, to, um, he tried not to overwork himself and it, it, it surprises a lot of people. Like he said, it is remarkable how much we could all do if we avoid hustling. And go about at an even pace and keep from attempting too much. Hmm. Uh, and uh, Yeah, that seems very counter to the, the... When you think of a robber baron, you think of a guy who's just constantly at the, at the club, at the office, uh, you know, conniving some new sale, new, new purchase. But uh, he would, he, several days a week, he'd go home early and do some gardening or spend time with his kids. Uh, and, of course, he lived into his 90s, and he attributed a lot of his longevity to the fact that uh, he, he paced himself. He, he learned yeah. to golf. He's a golf enthusiast, and uh, he liked to be outside in the fresh air. And so, but when he, when he would walk in the office... He could pick up a ledger and immediately find an error. He, he could uh, size up a person very quickly or walk through a refinery and see where there was wastage and very quickly make adjustments. And so his point was if you learn how to concentrate, you don't have to put as much time in because you zero right in on the issue and the problem and you solve mm. it. So you don't have to put hours in. You have time to rest and to go home at a reasonable hour. And so uh, Rockefeller was a study in contrast in many different ways. Yeah, that's really fascinating because I think just in today's age, and, I, and I've said this before, but I feel like the concentration factor, I think especially for millennials, you know, there's just so many distractions and there's so many things that you're constantly being notified about or updated on or plain old distraction that it's, it seems like a lost art or a lost ability for people to, to really have some deep focus. And, and, yeah. and, um, you, and we all have basically the same size of brain. Yeah. It's just that some people know how to focus that brain more than others. And uh, we all have the same length in a day. Yeah. But why is it some people get so much more done in the, in the same 24-hour period? And a lot of that's focus. It's not it's distracted thinking uh, does not get nearly as much done, doesn't have the same impact as focused thinking. And when you see leaders like this, they just, they could see, they found solutions others couldn't find because they knew how to concentrate and focus. Um, just a last thought or two about uh, uh, Rockefeller. At one point it looked like, uh, well, of course he had what, what were called trusts at that time because uh, there were laws that said you couldn't do business in other states. And so he just... He had Standard Oil, but uh, but there was a great fear in the American public, especially around the time of Theodore Roosevelt, that just felt that that huge companies were a danger to democracy and to the country. So uh, it, it finally, uh, some some uh, government leaders, congressmen, uh, they pushed through a law that said you can't if if you're you can't do a, a company can't do business in another state. So if you're doing, you have an oil refinery in New Jersey, you can't do business in Pennsylvania. And so ultimately what happened is his company, Standard Oil, had to be divided up and so into different states where they worked. And so what had been one company became 34 companies. And um, people were laughing at Rockefeller saying, finally, that, that old weasel has been... Uh, caught and his company's been divided into 34 different companies. The guy's the guy's done, but of course he owned a third 
of Standard Oil. So when you broke Standard Oil up into 34 companies, he owned a third of all 34 companies. And because he always kept them well financed and they always had financial reserves and things paid off and, and good r- repair, uh, when his companies were thrown to the stock market and now people could invest in Rockefeller's companies, people just flocked to buy shares in his companies. And the value of those companies just skyrocketed. And so basically it was th- what people considered his greatest setback became what made him a billionaire. Because just one of those companies became Exxon. Another company was Mobile Oil and uh, Conoco Oil. and BP, I think. Yeah, BP. And so when you you look at all of those oil companies today and you realize those all used to be Standard Oil, it made him fabulously wealthy. Yeah. Uh, And so you look at him and think, uh, that's just amazing that a guy could be that brilliant and survive. And, of course... um, when he first started in the oil business, you didn't have cars running yet. He started Standard Oil in around 1870. And so uh, it was for things like kerosene he was making, for kerosene lamps. Uh, the, the city streets and things often were lit, and homes were lit by kerosene. And so that's really what they were producing. They were producing this. Uh, it was, it was uh, Rockefeller who realized as the car industry was coming along that there was a whole new market yeah. for oil and, that, and gas and so on. And so he was able to be the one to improvise and move on. He, he also invested heavily in pipelines so that he wasn't dependent upon railroads anymore. And he was always looking ahead to say, how can we, we're vulnerable here. If we just have one customer, if we, uh, if we can't uh, diversify or, or make sure we're in control of uh, distribution, then we're in trouble. And so he was one of those guys who could always foresee trouble coming ahead and, and always landed back on his feet. I'd say one of the things, negative things about uh, Rockefeller would be that although he really worked at his family and he was very proud of his son, John Rockefeller, at one point when, when John Rockefeller Jr. was kind of starting out as an understudy of his dad, he got suckered into making about a million-dollar bad investment, lost a million dollars. And he had to come, and the most humiliating moment in his life was to tell his brilliant businessman father that he had just, by not doing his homework, by not doing his research, had lost a million dollars. And interestingly, his father just said, all right, son, I'll take care of it. Didn't didn't uh, and basically the, his biographer says Rockefeller realized his son was beating himself up. His 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 son really wanted to please his dad and felt stupid. Had realized he had just had been too eager. Had taken advice without double checking, and uh, and and uh, his biographer said by forgiving his son by by not rubbing his nose in it, it won his son's undying loyalty to him for the rest of his life, uh, wow. and. Uh, but on the other hand, his daughters, Rockefeller had some difficulty with. He had a daughter, Edith, that uh, married uh, poorly and who became estranged to him. And Rockefeller had to constantly bail her out. She was spending money foolishly, losing what money she had. And then she'd resent her dad for trying to help curb her spending habits and so on. And in the later years of Rockefeller's life, his own daughter would not come and see him anymore. And so the sad thing is, as so often happens with these kind of business people, very, very brilliant in handling business, but not quite as brilliant in handling their own family. And here's a guy at the very top of of the food chain in terms of business in America, but could not get his own daughter to come visit him in his dying years, his later years. And so you see... As so often you see a contrast between someone very good at business, not quite so good at family. And so many of these folks, as they got older, realizing that they had perhaps neglected some things that were really important in life. Uh, Accumulating money, once you're the wealthiest man in the world, accumulating more millions doesn't really make much difference. But having kids who want to come around and see you and bring the grandkids, you realize what matters at that point and what doesn't. That's what I love looking back at some of these great business leaders they're both an inspiration and and a cautionary tale Mm -hmm. and so uh rockefeller's no exception to that so appreciate you taking the time and and as we look through this i I know our our listeners enjoy these uh 
leader profiles and, and we'll have more in the future. And so until next time. Good to be with you as always. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If this is something you enjoyed, review us on Apple Podcasts and don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. If you have questions or comments, please email us at podcast at blackbee.org.